Hello. So welcome to lecture two. And today we're going to discuss Marxism and Marxist approaches to race and racism. So in the last class, we talked about uh, theories of race and racism and the ways that sociologists and other critical theorists have consistently proven that race is a social construct rather than something that is scientific in nature or uh, determined by God. So many theorists have argued uh, that race is a political tool. And we discussed the term race baiting, which is actually quite common in politics. And race baiting refers to the unfair and often untrue uses of race um, to advance one's political position or to uh, support class antagonism. So, Lecture two is about class antagonism and race. And I will discuss concepts from Marx, Karl Marx. Uh, and I will also cite from the article that is the required reading for this class written by Robert Miles. And it is from our textbook, Theories of Race and Racism. Critical race scholarship often draws on Marxism and racial capitalism is a term used by critical race scholars to discuss the ways that capitalism is often always racialized. And similarly, race itself as an idea or a set of ideas usually uh, implies some sort of class antagonism. So this is a clip of Dr. Ellie Anderson, um, who is an American academic uh, discussing the Communist Manifesto. So this is a remarkable. Dr. Anderson has this podcast called Overthink. The paper tablet created for people who like to take notes. It even feels. Consider a common view of human nature. That humans are greedy and have very little regard for how this impacts others. That humans are competitive. That survival of the fittest doesn't just mean adaptation to a given environment, as it does in Darwin, but rather means that some people are better than others, are entitled to more than others, and that they should take what they are entitled to by any means necessary. Such a view of human nature is often used to justify capitalism. But Marx and Engels ask us to consider whether things might be the other way around, what if the idea that humans are greedy and competitive is actually a product of the capitalist structure under which we live, rather than that quote unquote nature leading to capitalism? This is one of many examples of the way that Marx offers a bottom up approach. The idea that material conditions provide the possibility for our ways of thinking rather than our ways of thinking leading to material conditions. And Marx and Engels articulate this on page 172, among other places, where they say the selfish misconception that induces you to transform into eternal laws of nature and of reason 
the social forms springing from your present mode of production and form of property. This is a misconception of the ruling class. Ideologies often justify existing features of the status quo rather than actually reflecting things as they are in nature. And so Marx and Engels in the Communist Manifesto want to ask us to imagine whether things might be different from this. Let's say a few things about the argument in this text. The first is the division between two classes, the bourgeoisie and the proletarians, which we've already been talking about in our reading of Marx as the division between the capitalists and the workers. So the bourgeoisie is the class of modern capitalists who own the means of production and they are the employers of wage labor. The proletariat is the class of wage laborers. These people sell their labor power, their ability to do work, in order to live because they don't control the means of production. So they have to sell their labor power to other people because they don't have the means to create objects using their own labor power themselves. Marx and Engels describe, starting on page 163, how capitalism emerges out of feudalism, but comes to constitute its own economic system. So what are some of the features of capitalism at the time that Marx and Engels are writing? Well, first, they say that there's been a simplification of class antagonisms. Rather than a number of competing classes, there are now just two, right? There's been this increasing division. There's the bourgeoisie on the one hand and the proletariat on the other hand. Another feature of modern capitalism in Marx and Engels' time is that industry has established a world market. So think about the fact that Marx and Engels are writing during the Industrial Revolution when there has been a huge new focus on mass production of goods through factories. There's a bigger import-export trade than before. And so the increasing globalization of trading goods in a capitalist context is something that they also associate with the economic system at their time. Another feature is that the bourgeoisie has finally taken over the state. So there's not a distinction between the owners of the means of production and those governing. Rather, the bourgeoisie has overtaken the state either by installing members of its own within governance and or by basically owning those who govern by manipulating and controlling them in various manners. The interests of the bourgeoisie come to be the interests that the state is focused on, really. Additionally, traditional class hierarchies have been ruined, as have the relations between humans. Marx and Engels say on page 161 that now humans only relate to each other in terms of self-interest, essentially cash. What can we get out of each other? This has turned personal worth into exchange value, right? Exchange value allows us to judge goods relative to one another, right? How much is this vase worth compared to this other vase? We start to treat people like that. Are you worth more than this other person? In addition, under capitalism, the bourgeoisie starts to exploit the world globally. Think about colonialism, for instance. And the differences in culture and character between different countries or nations dissolve, giving way to a, quote, universal, civilized, and capitalist type of society. The progressivist view of history becomes this idea that all people have to be alike in order to count as civilized. All nations are compelled to adopt the bourgeois capitalist mode of production. Finally, capitalism in Marx and Engels' time also emphasizes centralization. The separation between the city and the country becomes stronger, with the city growing to have increasingly centralized power. And politics also becomes increasingly centralized as well. Actually, I said finally, but one additional feature of capitalism. Marx and Engels say that the exploitative nature of capitalism was originally veiled by political and religious illusions, but now doesn't even need to hide behind it. Bare exploitation comes to be socially accepted. It's just the way things are. Humans are competitive. They're greedy. 
if you're exploited, well, maybe you can eventually become the exploiter. Wouldn't that be great? In this text, Marx and Engels describe a gradual process that they are witnessing within capitalism that they think will lead to capitalism's overthrow. And I'm not gonna have space here to go through all of those stages, although I look forward to speaking with you about them. But what I wanna say here is something about the very broad strokes of what will be, in Marx and Engels' view, a communist revolution. The first is the formation of the proletariat into an actual class. There's this weird paradox whereby even though capitalism separates people into a class of capitalists and a class of proletarians, the proletarians lack what Marx calls class consciousness. They're not aware of the fact that they are all mutually exploited by the same system. And in order to overthrow the exploitative system, they have to band together by realizing that their bonds, their chains are mutually shared. The second is the overthrow of bourgeois supremacy, sometimes known as seizing the means of production. After the proletariat has constituted a class with class consciousness, Marx and Engels think that they need to take over bourgeois supremacy by say, taking over the means of production. The capitalists may own the means of production, but they actually don't know how to work them in the way that the laborers do, right? It's the laborers who have the material practical knowledge to create all of the things that the capitalists own. And so actually the proletarians need to recognize not only their shared chains, their shared exploitation, but also their shared power. Once they do that, and Engels think, it will be pretty easy for them to overthrow the capitalists because of this additional power and also because of sheer numbers. There are more proletarians than there are capitalists. Third, what will happen after the overthrow of bourgeois supremacy, Marx and Engels argue, will be the conquest of proletarian political power. They'll go from overthrowing the economic system to actually overtaking the political structure, which is infected, according to Marx and Engels, by bourgeois interests and manipulations. This will be the communist revolution. However, it's not all pretty after this. Marx and Engels are actually pretty pessimistic about the early stages of the communist revolution. They say it will look like despotism. And it will look like despotism because in inverting the ruling system where the capitalists are on top and the proletarians are on the bottom, we're still going to have a class hierarchy. Suddenly the proletarians will be on top and the capitalists will be on the bottom. The proletarians will take all capital, all accumulated wealth from the bourgeoisie, centralize all instruments of production into the state, right? So further the capitalist project of centralization and increase the total number of productive forces. In doing so, you can see that the initial phases of proletarian rule are actually pretty similar to capitalism. It's just a difference of who's in power, right? There's still accumulation of wealth, there's still centralization, and there's still an increase in productive forces. So in a way, the initial phase of proletarian rule is like an amplified version of capitalism. But eventually, the proletarian rule of political power, Marx and Engels say, will drop away. And there will be an association of free subjects who will no longer even need the centralization in the state. That will be a chance for humans to realize their full expression of human nature as productive creators, because they won't be productively creating for the purpose of accumulating wealth or surviving, but rather because they enjoy it and because they enjoy each other and they enjoy experiencing the full range of human life. I look forward to talking with you about the list of objections to communism that Marx and Engels lay out on pages 170 to 175 and then sort of debunk. Um, curious what you think about that. For now, I want to close by just asking, returning to the sort of theme of the course overall, what do Marx and Engels trust? Well, they trust the material forces of history that are leading to greater freedom. There's still a logic or reason here right, is driving history. In that sense, they trust very similar forces to Hegel. There's still a teleology to history. But for them, unlike for Hegel, the trust should be placed in material conditions themselves rather than the increasing actualization of spirit in material conditions. I used to work nine.
So that is a clip about the Communist Manifesto, and it's quite comprehensive in discussing some of the major themes from Marx and Engels. So in your reading this week, Robert Miles makes reference to Marx, um, and the author states that one of the earliest Marxist texts to analyze race relations was O.C. Cox's Caste, Class, and Race. It was first published in the United States in 1948. Despite the existence of another tradition of Marxist writing in the U.S., a, which claimed to theorize race, Cox's book was cited for a long time by Marxists and non-Marxists alike as the seminal Marxist statement and the work of the Frankfurt School, which was produced during its exile from Germany. Um, was largely ig ignored. Uh, so Cox's book then um, was this Marxist statement and it was a work of the Frankfurt School, but um, Robert Miles argues that it was largely ignored. And um, the Marxist tradition has been foundational in in sociology, it's been uh, important in the discipline of sociology. And um, Marxist theory um, also created a whole series of neo-Marxist neo approaches to studying sociology and social problems and social life, such as feminist theory and anti-racist theory. And these theories are considered to be conflict theories. So at the heart of Marx of, or Marxism um, is the idea of ideology. And ideology is one of the most interesting and I think confounding philosophical principles in Marxism. For Marx, ideology refers to that which we do, but do not know that we are doing. So ideology um, is often referred to also as a form of consciousness or false consciousness, where we are, are unaware that we are supporting the conditions of our own um, oppression. And Marx argues consistently throughout his writings that the ruling ideology is the ideology of the ruling class. Um, so although the majority of people in the world will not own the means of production, they will perhaps perpetuate the ideologies of the ruling class, meaning that we will uh, inadvertently, or perhaps inevitably support uh, our own degradation in favor of those who have more economic capital than us. And this can happen in very subtle everyday ways, uh, instances where people do not have a certain amount of financial capital or willing to go into massive amounts of debt to mimic the lifestyles of the rich. This can also happen um, in more subtle ways that involve value and the kind of value we ascribe to certain languages or to certain ideas or to certain texts. Um, it can also happen, I think, geopolitically that many people uh, often think that the global north is uh, immediately superior to the global south because of the amount of food food resources and economic capital and wealth that people in the global north have in comparison to people in the global south. So uh, Marx is really interested then in the ways that ideologically it is really difficult to ever think outside of or against capitalism. And I think this is more true now in our time period than it was in the time when Marx wrote the Communist Manifesto and other texts, that it is really difficult to oppose capitalism. And 
it can be difficult to find value in things that are not coded as being um, affluent in nature. There are a whole series of other theorists, sociologists like Pierre Bourdieu, uh, who write after Marx and discuss what Bourdieu refers to as cultural capital. And Bourdieu's arguments are uh, really interesting if we think about race as a form of cultural capital, or if we think about how race uh, produces cultural capital. And Bourdieu argues that cultural capital refers to non-financial assets, ways in which people connote a certain class or they uh, try to appear to be middle class in ways that do not involve money. So knowing how to speak in the English language in a certain way, um, knowing how to even walk in a certain way or wear clothing uh, that looks a certain way is all a form of cultural capital. Even the ways that we eat could be seen to be a form of cultural capital. So uh, even if you have a lot of money, um, you might not be seen to be middle class because you might not know all of these codes and rules of how to appear to be middle class. And this is, I think, interesting when we think about race, that even if people of color become middle class, will they have the kind of cultural capital that makes them believable as the middle class? Um, and if one is not believed to be someone who has access to capital or even citizenship, then will there be consequences that could even involve policing or murder. So Robert Miles draws on Cox then throughout this article, and uh, Miles writes that Cox's alternative theorization is of interest because of the way in which it incorporated the ideas of race and race relations, and attributed them with analytic status within the framework of Marxism. As a result, Marxists could claim contra-bourgeois theorists that they too had a theory of race relations, a theory that was, at least as far as they were concerned, superior. But the ideas of race and race relations had no specifically Marxist content. Cox, in the manner of mainstream sociological thinking, noted and then passed by the certainties about the biological meaning of race and defined race as any group of people that is generally believed to be and gen generally accepted as a race in any given area of ethnic competition. What distinguished a group as a race was the real or imputed physical characteristics, and hence he defined race relations as behavior which develops among peoples who are aware of each other's actual or imputed imputed physical differences. So Cox proposed that historically, the race pre prejudice was a recent phenomenon and that its origin lay in the development of capitalism. He claimed that race relations arose from the proletarianization of labor power in the Caribbean. Race prejudice being the rationalization developed by the bourgeoisie for its inhuman and degrading treatment of the workforce. Thus, race prejudice was defined as a social attitude propagated by an exploiting class for the purpose of stigmatizing some groups as inferior so that the exploitation of either the group itself of its resources or both may be justified. And the most extreme form of exploitation was obviously slavery. It therefore facilitated a process of labor exploitation and hence arose after that system of exploitation had been established. So slavery and indenture were some of the most extreme forms of human exploitation in all of human history. And what Marxist theorists often argue is that if it was not for slavery and indenture, um, the kind of negative associations that people still might have about skin color would perhaps not exist or would not be so extreme.
So exploitation and proletarianization are within the framework of Marxist theory, universal capitalist processes. Because, because race relations are not deemed to have arisen from the process of proletarianization within, for example, Europe, it follows that it is necessary to identify what distinguishes the exploitation and proletarianization that give rise to race relations in the Caribbean. Race relations, Cox argued, arose when the bourgeoisie successfully proletarianized a whole people. This happened in the Caribbean and the USA, but not in Europe, where only a section of white people, i.e. part of the white race, were proletarianized. So for Cox, this did not alter the essential identity of the two processes in both instances. A group of people was subordinated to a bourgeoisie whose primary interest was the exploitation of the former's labor former's labor power. Hence, for Cox, racial antagonism was in essence class conflict or political class conflict, conflict as he conceptualized class struggle because the latter arose from the exploitation of labor power. It follows that race relations and prejudice arose from the historically specific processes of colonialism and imperialism that accompanied the development of capitalism as a world economic system. So race thinking and racist thinking often always involves this class element. So when people of color are middle class or appear to have things, um, sometimes it really bothers people and people will think, well, uh, there are no problems of racism. And this is something that people have said to me in Canada before, that if you see people of color who I guess have clothing and uh, have gone to a dentist, then that means there's no problem of racial discrimination so that, that there should be no affirmative action. I mean, these arguments seem sort of ridiculous in some ways, but the logic behind this thinking is that affirmative action or um, any kind of anti-racism only exists for extremely poor people. And sometimes you find, especially in Canada, I found that there are middle class white liberals who become obsessed with kind of charities in the global south or conflicts in the global south, but they don't take racism seriously uh, in the countries in which they live. So the argument being that only when people of color are starving to death or dying are their lives or are our lives worth any consideration um, from others. Uh, and the argument also is one that does not allow for the possibility of meritocracy. So if someone is the best person for the job, then they are. And someone's favoritism towards white people who are seen to be deserving to be middle class should not uh, interfere with fair decision making. Um, the other extreme then is on the one hand, in my experience, people have a problem when people of color are middle class or rich, but when people of color are poor, uh, the problem then escalates to the point where seeing poor people of color hanging out on the street or living in working class neighborhoods could call could cause someone to call the police, as in the case of the murder of George Floyd and many other working class black people who have been killed uh, by police as civilians and citizens of the United States of America and Canada. So these kind of arguments about class really ultimately lead to fantasies of death, that people of color cannot be middle class and uh, should not have things that other people do, or else they're seen to be people who have been given too much. But then people of color cannot be working class or poor, or they're seen to be a threat to the white middle class and therefore can be policed. Ultimately, these arguments uh, are arguments that are made by people who hate people of color and perhaps do not want people of color to be citizens of the global north. Sometimes people are so racist that their fantasies of race um, extend to other countries. So in the past, I have met people who have gone to India and uh, they have been people who uh, 
tell me that they went to India and they actually saw people who were rich in India and uh, they couldn't believe it. And they again go into this kind of narrative about there are people in India who have a lot of money. And yes, this is true. But this is a problem for someone who is a racist because then the argument becomes well these people obviously don't have any problems and yes why would they because they're people of color and people of color must have problems or or else they i guess would be the same as anyone else then the arguments extend to they did see people who were in slums and it was really horrible and they had so much disease and India is a horrible place. So Indian people cannot also be poor because the argument is that it's threatening to white people who are the only people who I guess are deserving of life. So these arguments about class antagonism go on and on and on. And obviously at the root of this kind of anxiety about middle class people of color and about working class people of color is the fantasy of annihilation and of white supremacy. If you like Kensington, you'll love the South Bank. There are really So this is a clip of Dr. Lisa Tilly discussing Racial capitalism. And if you could just say your name, you'd be great. Uh, Robert Brown. Well, I'm a, a simple, simple. Okay, so the first name to familiarize yourselves with in relation to racial capitalism is that of an incredible scholar by the name of um, Cedric Robinson who authored a number of books, including one entitled Black Marxism, in which he sets out an engagement with the context and politics of what's known as the Black radical tradition, which is something that we'll come back to a little bit later on. Um, and it's also in this work that Robinson borrows this concept of racial capitalism from South African intellectuals who were using it at the time to analyze the apartheid context. And he extends this concept into a more expansive global historical analysis and a broader theory of global capitalism. So you're probably already familiar with the name Karl Marx, as Marx is one of the most famous European political economists whose work, especially his most famous volumes of work known as Capital, has really inspired intellectuals and activists globally for the past 150 years or so. But <clears throat> even though the work of Marx has had global resonance and has inspired liberation struggles, his own focus of analysis was much more on the European industrial experience. So, for example, he really closely considered the production of value by labourers spinning cotton in, in English mills, more than he considered the production of value by the enslaved in the colonies picking the cotton destined for those mills. And overall, there are really important aspects of the global economy, particularly colonialism, enslavement and plantation production, which were more broadly in, in the European political economy tradition, not sufficiently factored into theories of, of accumulation. Um, but still, Marx was also the key interlocutor for Cedric Robinson in this text, Black Marxism. Um, and Robinson advanced a really generous engagement with, um, but also some important criticisms of some of the fundamentals of Marxist thought in, in this important book. Um, and we'll talk a bit about the ways Robinson challenged Marx just a little bit later in this lecture. But first, we'll cover how Robinson set up the idea of racial capitalism by approaching Europe through a historical and anthropological lens and examining capitalism as largely a cultural product of Europe. And this method of tracing its history 
reveals capitalism to be a system imbued with flaws and logics, which are products of European histories. So in Black Marxism, Robinson defines something that he calls racialism, which he says is a European cultural product. And racialism refers to, and I'll quote Robinson directly here, the legitimation and corroboration of social organization as natural by reference to the racial components of its elements. So to state this in a slightly different way, racialism broadly refers to how unjust forms of subjugation and exploitation are broadly accepted within a particular social system as natural and inevitable because of perceived intrinsic differences between cultures or ethnicities. So the idea that some supposedly inferior people are meant to be exploited for the material benefit of supposedly superior others. And Robinson presents evidence for the existence and reproduction of racialism by documenting historical forms of exclusion, enslavement and exploitation which have been enacted along the lines of national or ethnic difference. And the examples that he covers go back to racialized groups that we would today probably include as Europeans, but who were historically referred to as barbarians. And he also covers, for example, the, the English construction of the Irish as inferior and therefore exploitable. So racism itself and the forms of racial social ordering, which would go on to take many forms under capitalism, began, according to Robinson's account, with oppressions that took place within a Europe in, in formation. Um, and from there, what was rehearsed across the Mediterranean initially as Europe's internal oppressions would ultimately be extended and played out and taken to new extremes across the Atlantic and elsewhere. And when Robinson articulated his theory of racial capitalism as a European cultural product, he described a system um, which is not fully explained by the technical dynamics of accumulation and value production alone. So instead, Robinson sought to analyze how and why it was Get summer sorted with flights from just £32 one way and package holidays at unbeatable prices from £319. To quote him directly here, that something of a more profound nature than the obsession with property was askew in a civilization that could organise and celebrate on a scale beyond previous human experience, the brutal degradations of life and the most acute violations of human destiny. So these brutal degradations of capitalism include the kinds of expropriation, dispossession, exploitation, degradation that we still witness across the world today. And a system founded on all of this, um, according to Robinson, requires something more than simply class distinctions to reproduce itself. So, some really important thinkers um, have done yeah. more recent theoretical work to expand our understanding of racial capitalism. So you might want to follow up work by Robin D.G. Kelly, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, Gargi Bhattacharya and others. And to draw very briefly on some of their reflections, racial capitalism is in Ruthie Wilson Gilmore's terms, simply all of capitalism. And emphasizing the racial is simply a means of understanding, to pick up Gargi Bhattacharya's words here, the role of racism in enabling key moments of capitalist development. And Bhattacharya also says that racial capitalism includes the sedimented histories of racialized dispossession that shape economic life in our time, but is never reducible to those histories. So in short, the racial in the compound concept of racial capitalism forces us to confront 
the unmistakable material histories of race which live on in the present, but it also forces us to confront the novel mutations of race and capitalism, which produce new and renewed forms of exploitation and expropriation through contemporary market innovations. And these material histories of race are really easily missed within a political economy that's overly rooted or wholly rooted within um, the European proletarian experience. Because, for example, while proletarianization, so this is the formation of the worker from the peasantry, while proletarianization in England created workers for the mills and factories, the picture has been quite different elsewhere. So we risk missing how workers are produced and extracted in relation to other economic and industrial processes. So to pick up Cedric Robinson's words again, the organizers of the capitalist world system appropriated black labor power as constant capital. Black communities were extracted from their social formations through mechanisms that minimized the disruption of the production of labor. And to apply this to the present, we might say that the constant production of poverty in the global South through processes of extraction, structural adjustment, the corporate exploitation of labor and degradation of the environment among various other methods. This production of poverty creates the conditions which drive labor migration to the global north. So it sounds somewhat counterintuitive, but the response to this um, in the global north is actually economic inclusion within highly exploitative, low paid, high risk jobs in countries like the US and the, US and the UK. Um, but this economic inclusion of migrant labor from the global south is coupled with political exclusion by means of really complex bordering practices, um, brutal deportations, and so on. So we can also argue that political exclusion is in itself racializing in the way that it constructs some people as outsiders, as others, as inferior, as undeserving, and confines people to degrading material conditions. So the current inhumane and harmful detention of asylum seekers at Napier Barracks in the UK during the COVID pandemic is a really key example of this. And of course, racialization as inferior in turn keeps racialized labor cheap and exploitable. So there's a dynamic and complementary relationship between economic inclusion and political exclusion. And so the capitalist world system can still be said to produce racialized labor power as constant capital in Robinson's terms. So let's just spend a moment clarifying what we mean by the black radical tradition. So this is the broader tradition from which Cedric Robinson's intellectual project is birthed. And Robinson himself was directly in conversation with thinkers such as C.L.R. James, Richard Wright, and Du Bois in, in particular. And this tradition in Robinson's reading is neither derivative of whiteness, so it's not simply a response to white power, um, nor was it birthed in the Middle Passage. So in other words, it doesn't begin with black enslavement. And instead, it draws on those modes of resistance, which were, just to pick up Robinson's words directly, formed through the meanings that Africans brought to the new world as their cultural possession, meanings sufficiently distinct from the foundations of Western ideas as to be remarked upon over and over by the European witnesses of their manifestations. Meanings enduring and powerful enough to survive slavery, to become the basis of an opposition to it. So to emphasize Robinson's words, the tradition draws on ideas and meanings which predate and, and survive the transatlantic slave trade 
and which have formed the basis of resistance to enslavement and to other forms of oppression since. So fundamentally then, the black radical tradition is the antithesis of racial capitalism. Rooted in a distinct cultural con consciousness and cultivated against and in spite of enslavement, colonization and exploitation, it materializes what Robinson calls the collective and personal chemistries that congealed into social movement. So worded another way, the black radical tradition is a dynamic and forceful ideology of liberation. This is how AI optimizes my schedule. This meeting got canceled. Hooray, we didn't really want to go. So Cedric Robinson's historically informed theorization of racial capitalism from this black radical position challenged the work of Marx in at least three really important and in interrelated ways. So first of all, where Marx understood capitalism as a rupture from European feudal society, Robinson instead documented the extension of feudal relations into what he called the larger tapestry of the modern world's political and economic relations. So in other words, the antagonistic social codes of feudalism remained present in the DNA of capitalism as it developed and spread. And second, where Marx anticipated processes of rationalization or homogenization within social classes under a capitalist system. So for example, a cohesive working class with a unified class consciousness Robert Robinson instead observed a system with a tendency to differentiate and exploit along lines of difference. So just to quote him again directly, the bourgeoisie that led the development of capitalism were drawn from particular ethnic and cultural groups. The European proletariats and the mercenaries of leading states from others its peasants from still other cultures and its slaves from entirely different worlds. The tendency of European civilization through capitalism was thus not to homogenize, but to differentiate, to exaggerate regional, subcultural and dialectical differences into racial ones. And finally, where Marx abstracted a universal theory of capitalism from an empirical reading with a prominent focus on the industrial manufacturing centers of Europe, Robinson instead shifted analytical attention away from England's mills to the really diverse formative sites of capitalist development across the colonized world. And he disturbed those more Euro-centered theories of class consciousness formation in the process. So an analytical shift from the English factory to the plantations of the Caribbean, for example, serves to complicate universal abstractions around labor and class and revolutionary consciousness mm -hmm. based on the European proletarian experience. We start to see these things differently. So Let's think a little bit more about these three adjustments in turn. So beginning with Robinson's account of the extension of antagonistic feudal relations into capitalist formations. So the text Black Marxism deals with the continuities stretching from the unfree forms of labor exploitation to which the so-called Slavs and the Irish and others have been subjected to later arenas of capitalism in which enslaved labor remained, what Robinson called a critical basis of production. So by the time Europeans were in a position to more extensively extract and exploit the power of black labor, they'd already developed the racializing tools which could be adapted to justify the enslavement of other peoples. And shifts from feudal serfdom to capitalism simply served to relocate rather than end enslavement as a central form of labor exploitation. And medieval slavery within Europe served as a model for Atlantic colonial slavery in Robinson's words. And relating to the second adjustment that we identify here, 
the assertion of capitalism's tendency to differentiate and to exploit difference rather than necessarily homogenize within social classes. Robinson emphasizes the persistent centrality of migrant labor to capitalism. And this fact is often lost in political economy analyses, which sometimes confine themselves to a particular nation and which reproduce categories such as the English working class, divorced from their wider connections and, and overlaps. So Robinson reinforced instead how working class consciousness became acutely attuned to the value of racial and ethnic difference and the relation of these to the constructed and very much enduring false distinction between skilled and unskilled workers. Going further, he explained that, to quote him directly again, of particular interest is the extent to which racialism and subsequently nationalism, both as ideology and actuality, affected the class consciousness of workers in England. In the intensely racial social order of England's industrializing era, the phenomenology of the relations of production bred no objective basis for the extrication of the universality of class from the particularisms of race. Working class discourse and politics remained marked by the architectonic possibilities previously embedded in the culture. So in other words, the experience of work doesn't inevitably lead to collective class consciousness across racial divides, and the implications of this are, for example, that white racial interest can undermine broader class interest as workers identifying with whiteness will often align with the white bourgeoisie within a nationalist racial project against the interests of workers of color and even against their own interests as workers in some cases. So this way of understanding the dynamics of class and race within the phenomenology of work, as Robinson puts it, also allows us to overcome simplistic readings which hold that an end to racialized exclusion in and of itself is necessarily emancipatory. So one instructive case through which to explore this is through Henry Ford's self-described Ford empire the operations of mass production, which brought the world to the ideology and the organizing system of Fordism. So if we take Ford's River Rouge plant in Dearborn, Michigan, the assembly line production set up here was the largest in, in US history. And it was also really famous for employing African-American workers. And this is often inaccurately presented as evidence of Ford's progressivism in the sense that the employment of black workers countered segregationist industrial practices. But when we look a bit more closely, black workers were overwhelmingly employed in the hot and dangerous parts of Ford plants in the US. So they were exposed to more harm and risk than his white workers were. So as a scholar called Elizabeth Etch explains in her book, The Color Line and the Assembly Line, Ford also had a specific view of the African-American workers who made the journey up to Michigan to seek work in his car plants. So unlike European immigrants who Ford originally sought to Americanize, Etch argues that Ford thought of black migrant workers to Detroit as more akin to colonized subjects and treated them as such. Mm. African-American workers were to the company neither sufficiently American nor Americanizable. So again, engagement with empirical examples of capitalist exploitation reveal the tendency to differentiate and exploit difference. And the phenomenology of work alone may not be enough to overcome this in order to forge a universal class consciousness. So finally, to go back to the third adjustment to Marx, the analytical shift from the factory to the plantation and other formative sites of capitalist production, reveals that enslaved and other forms of unfree labor cannot be confined to a pre-capitalist phase, 
but has instead endured in various forms for, for centuries. But really importantly, the forms of political consciousness generated among the enslaved, the indentured, and among those who built maroon communities and other projects of resistance show that, again, in Robinson's words, the European proletariat and its social allies did not constitute the revolutionary subject of history. So if we move away from European factories and consider the plantations of the world which have been so formative to capitalist development, we find that plantations have always been productive of new peasant worker subjectivities, which in turn have been prone to resistance and rebellions. And the enslaved, indentured and free but exploited plantation workers have a special place in the historiography of anti-colonial struggles as agents contributing to radical changes in the global political economy through the formal liberation of colonized areas. And these deserve much more attention in global histories of resistance and, and revolution. So just to round off and summarize, racial capitalism asks us to think again about the centrality of race and to the formation of capitalism, as well as the ways in which race operates and is reproduced in the novel market spaces of the present day. It asks us also to be attuned to the constant production and reproduction of difference and the exploitation and expropriation of those who are differentiated as inferior. But it also causes us to pay more attention to those who have been and remain revolutionary subjects of history, the enslaved, the maroons, anti-colonial plantation workers, migrant workers, and others who might not fit the frame of the ideal working class figure, but who've done so much to deliver rights and justice globally. A clip of Dr. Lisa Tilly discussing racial capitalism. And the next section of the lecture, which I might record separately, the argument that I am going to make is from David Rodiger's writing regarding racial capitalism and whiteness. And the argument that Rodiger makes um, is quite different from Cedric Robinson and other Marxist scholars like Walter Rodney, who focused on the condition of exploitation, extreme exploitation of enslaved Black people and colonized people. And Rodiger actually focuses on the white working class. And the argument that David Rodiger makes is that white working class people gain a wage, and it is a wage of whiteness. And so Rodiger argues that in many cases, white working class people actually do significant damage to themselves as a class of people uh, in order to align themselves with or pretend to be white middle class people. And Rodiger gives many examples from working class history where um, white workers refused to participate in labor unions or strikes, or they refused to show solidarity with other workers. Um, and there are lots of other examples of uh, what Marxists might term false consciousness, um, which often involves a refusal to see oneself as part of the working class and uh, constant efforts to mimic the bourgeoisie. Um, so in the end, the question is really who cares about white men? And I would argue that the election of Donald Trump and other affluent or you could use the term rich people to political office often involves exploiting white working class men and poor white people um, whom affluent people often use uh, for votes but do nothing for. So the rise of the alt-right and the rise of affluent Republican political leaders who pretend to be uh, 
the common man um, has meant that white working class people and poor white people often vote against their own interests as a class. Um, and this has, I think, led to the election of affluent political leaders who often pass very stringent policies against those who do not own property uh, and those who cannot afford to own housing, many of whom are poor and white working class people. However, Rodiger argues that this kind of mythology of whiteness um, often allows for a fantasy uh, that is classless in nature. And there have been other uh, scholars who have written extensively about the white working class. So there's a book called Growing Up Girl, which is written by Valerie Walker Dine and is another author. And the book actually looks at the experiences of working class girls um, in England. And again, this sense of being white often causes young white women and girls to do things that are not in their own interests in order to uh, approximate the white middle class, even though these girls are often not middle class and cannot afford certain products and cannot afford certain lifestyles. So this sense of aligning oneself with the middle class by being white and by being proud to be white is something that uh, can do damage to the working class overall. But ultimately, uh, the sense of the lack of solidarity involves a lack of class consciousness, uh, which has affected the labor movement in negative ways. So the book Growing Up Girl is called Psycho is called Growing Up Girl Psychosocial Explorations of Gender and Class. And it's written by Valerie Walker Dine, Helen Lucy, and June Medley. And the book is really about the lives of girls who've grown up in the last decades of the 20th century and into the 21st, examining the complex ways that wealth and poverty, class and ethnicity are forever changed, but terribly present in their experiences and life chances. And this is also true of Rodiger's writings about the white working class, that irrespective of whatever fantasies people have about skin color, uh, class is really often what determines someone's capacity to survive, particularly in cities that are extremely expensive in the United States of America, and particularly in times in which um, if one does not own property, they might not have the capacity to be housed consistently. So Rodiger's writings provide an original study of the formative years of working working class racism in the U.S. Rodiger argues um, that working class racism cannot be explained simply with reference to economic advantage. Rather, white, white working class Class racism is underpinned by a complex series of psychological and ideological mechanisms that reinforce stereotypes and thus help to forge identities of white workers in opposition to blacks. So this kind of psychological feeling of belonging, of being white and being proud to be white is something that authors document in the lives of the white working class. And this is also true of white working class girls and women who often have a feeling, a psychological feeling of belonging 
because they are white, which often causes uh, one to feel as though they're not working class when they are. The problem is that a lack of solidarity or a lack of participation in the labor union movement or consistently refusing to work properly and pretending to be middle class can do damage to one's own interests over time. So Robert Miles then cites uh, Rex and Tomlinson's writings regarding the white working class and regarding uh, poor white people. What is interesting about Rex's work, writes Miles, is that he has attempted to utilize his conceptual framework in two seminal studies of race relations in Birmingham during the 1960s and the 1970s. In the study conducted by Rex and his associates in the Hansworth area of Birmingham during the mid-1970s, the basic Research problem was to explore the degree to which immigration populations share the class position of their white neighbors and white workers in general. The substance of the analysis goes on to outline a class structure in which white workers have been granted certain rights that have been won through the working class movement, through the trade unions and the Labour Party. For Rex, an important feature of the position of migrant workers and their children is that they are located outside the process of negotiation that has historically shaped the position of white workers. They experience discrimination in all areas where the white workers have made significant gains, such as employment, education, and housing. So the problem with the white working class and their racism is that many people who are migrants or immigrants and their children might end up perhaps supporting fiscal conservatism and might end up perhaps not supporting the working class. The concept of underclass was intended to suggest that the minorities were systematically at a disadvantage compared with their white peers. And instead of identifying with working class culture, community and politics, they formed their or own organizations and became effectively a separate underprivileged class. So this splintering of the working class into the white working class and other groups of people uh, who will not do business with each other or will not even be part of the same union has uh, obviously um, weakened uh, the class interests of the working class and what was once the left wing. And now we see the rise of conservative politicians throughout the world who are fiscal conservatives and capitalists. Um, this has also meant that the housing rights movement has been under threat um, in ways that it had never has been uh, to the point that privatized housing might be the only housing that is available for many people in the future. So Nancy Eisenberg has written extensively about the white working class and Eisenberg's book is called White Trash. Uh, and it looks at the stigmatization of, of the white working class um, and the ways that the white working class uh, still continue to be persecuted. And I would argue that the problem with this kind of persecution is that um, often the response to persecution is not to form solidarity with people of color, but to join right wing white supremacist groups, which cause the white working class to be further reviled and hated. A look at the history of poor white Americans. That's the focus of the latest edition of the NewsHour Bookshelf. Here's Jeffrey Brown. This book tells many stories. Arguably the most important is the one we as a people have trouble embracing, the pervasiveness of a class hierarchy in the United States. That line comes from a new book with the provocative title, White Trash, which makes a provocative argument that from the nation's earliest history to now, ideals such as opportunity and, up, and upward mobility have not characterized the lives of many Americans. Author Nancy Eisenberg is a professor of history at Louisiana State University, and welcome to you. Well, thanks for having me. I think what hit me most is the idea that the poor have not only been accepted, but expected that it's a part of our national DNA. 
That's the argument you're making? Well, I think one of the things we forget is that for half of our history, we were an agrarian nation. So white trash really comes out of notions of rural poverty. And it goes all the way back to British ideas because in the colonial period and well into throughout the 19th century, the mark of being a successful America was being a property owner. And what we've forgotten is that large numbers of Americans did not own property. For example, in Thomas Jefferson's Virginia, at the time of the revolution, 40% of white men were landless. So when you refer to white trash, I just want to be clear, mm -hmm. and, and, and the idea of white trash, literally the, the term was used, uh, the terms like waste, who, who do you mean? Yes, the, the word white trash, at least as far as we've been able to discover, was first appeared in newspaper print in the 1820s. But it has a much older meaning, because if we go back to some of the leading promoters of British colonization, when they imagined what were they going to do with the new world, the new world, first of all, was imagined as a wilderness, what they called a wasteland. And it was the perfect place for literally dumping the idle poor. And these were referred to as waste people. So those are the beginnings. But your argument is that that has pervaded up to our own time, that we have the national myth of opportunity and social mobility. Are you saying that those don't exist for everyone or that they don't exist for one subset of people? No, I think there is clearly you can find examples of people who have been able to rise up and improve themselves. The problem is that we exaggerate the idea that at the time of the revolution, we abandoned the class system. We created an ex exceptional society where we celebrated upward mobility. But in fact, what the founders like Franklin and Jefferson really believed in is similar to what the British had in mind, that the poor would be allowed to move into the frontier, or what was known as the Southern back country and the old Northwest. And what they were really promising was horizontal mobility, not upward mobility. And land then, as you say, was the key factor, not education, not uh, energy or, or earning. But what about now? I would say that land is still extremely important. Class has a geography. If we think about the way most Americans live, and the other measure of class that I highlight is home ownership. If you're poor, the same way they had different names for the poor, they had different names for what they live in, a shack, a shebang, or if we talk about trailer trash. Uh, what we live in today, we live in class zone neighborhoods. We, we have taken into account the importance of racial segregation, and we know that history, but we also live in neighborhoods that are divided by class. And if you live in a better neighborhood, you have more amenities, you have better infrastructure, better schools. And so geography still plays a very important part. And land, owning a house is a very important measure of being a member of the middle class. I know you wrote the book before we got into the <laughs> politics of the current campaign, but how do you see class driving our politics today? I don't see Donald Trump and the issues brought up by Bernie Sanders as that surprising because at crucial moments when politicians are involved, they do use class language. They do <laughs> heighten and emphasize class distinctions. So that gets pulled, we get pulled in two directions there too, because sometimes politicians like to say, we're all in the middle class. Or we all have ambition to be in the middle class, or we're all capable of being the middle class. That's when they want to sort of draw from the more positive script. But at other times, I talk about key politicians who used class as a way to mobilize uh, political divisions or to accentuate political divisions in our country. Okay, I'll stop it there in the interest of time. And I'm going to record this lecture in two parts uh, because of time. So Rodiger's argument, as I mentioned, is uh, similar in the sense that Nancy Eisenberg is interested in the ways that um, poverty and the normalization of poverty, I think, has always been central to history. Um, so rather than moving towards an equitable future, uh, class divisions and class hierarchies, I think, are central to how political governance works in this time period. So um, the creation of classes of people of, of 
those who are excluded from say owning property or from owning the means of production is I think uh, central to nation building. And Eisenberg mentions land in her book and uh, obviously in the context of settler Canada, um, the theft of land and the settlement of indigenous land has led to uh, extreme forms of violence against indigenous people as evinced in the missing and murdered indigenous women and girls report and the truth and reconciliation commission report. So class antagonism and creating generations of people who are poor and perhaps uh, are declassed over generations is central to nation building. Um, the law is obviously one of the ways that this kind of perpetuation of class inequality of poverty over generations is addressed. However, the psychological wage uh, that one gains uh, from kind of celebrating um, a sense of nihilism is something that cannot be legislated against. And it's something that authors discuss in texts when they look at attitudes towards addiction and mental health and consumerism among young people. Um, and I think that the psychological wage that white workers get from being racist, but also that many people gain from um, self-destructive patterns of behavior overall is something that cannot be dealt with um, using law alone. And Walker Dine and Lucy and Melody's text, Growing Up Girl, um, is a really interesting text because it does involve gender. And if one was to consider gender alongside race, then the kind of performative enactments of masculinity and femininity uh, are never separate from class and separate from race. And Valerie Walker Dine and Helen Lucy and June Melody um, document the kind of um, ways that self-destructive behavior uh, becomes normalized among it among working class girls and women particularly in order to uh, gain male attention and so class I think is an issue that cannot be dealt with just by looking at labor relations. And Rodiger's book is really about a psychological wage. So Rodiger argues that class cannot be explained simply in terms of economic advantage. Rather, white working class racism is underpinned by a complex series of psychological and ideological mechanisms that reinforce force racial stereotypes and thus help to forge the identities of workers in opposition to Blacks. In a new preface, Rodiger reflects on the reception, influence, and critical response to the wages of whiteness, while Kathy McCleaver's insightful introduction hails the importance of a work that has become a classic. So, Jan McClintock has documented the ways that the white family as an imperial ideal uh, has been solidified throughout history in narratives justifying colonial rule. And um, Anne McClintock argues that imperialism was often justified by trying to construct 
white colonizing men as family men who were stealing and enslaving from others to support this kind of Christian family, which was seen to be more important than any other kinship network in the world. And McClintock cites these colonial archives in which um, having a family for a white person was seen to be more important than any kingdom uh, or any kind of other religious tradition or any tradition of uh, nation building in the colonies. So this construction of the white Judeo-Christian family as being superior to all other forms of civilization is a narrative uh, that appears over and over again in colonial history. And the idea of paternity and maternity is used again and again as a metaphor for colonization. In its most extreme, um, this kind of paternity is used to justify um, the sexual abuse of children in Christian and Catholic missionary schools in settler Canada. So the TRC report, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report documents the ways that Indigenous children were forcibly removed from their parents' homes and were molested and beaten and sometimes killed in Christian and Catholic schools run by Canada's Christian and Catholic settlers. So this kind of paternity or maternity was often um, a way of justifying child abuse and rape and murder. So I'll finish there and I will record the second half of the lecture, which will be about migration theory, citizenship, race, and class. Uh, in another video. So that is the first half of this lecture about race and class, citing Robert Miles' work and other scholars who are interested in race and capitalism. Thank you.